Hey friends, this is Waylon Lewis of Elephant and I am here with yet another amazing guest as I love to say almost every day because we are having so many amazing guests. Today I have Melanie Sue. Uh, Melanie, where are you? I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Oh, we should have done this in person. I know, I thought of that later. <laughs> so hold up your um, your book and, and tell us what your whole life is about. Incongruent. Yeah. So, and what, what's the subtitle there? Can you put uh, it right travel, up in the trauma, camera? Travel, transformation. So travel, trauma, and transformation. transformation. Yes, yes. So incongruent is, uh, the backbone of the story is a trek to Everest Space Camp. So it's a it's a 14-day trek. It's eight days up and six days down. And some beautiful sights, some beautiful stories, some some really uh, crazy things happened to us and in our group on the trek. We almost... Uh, got into a car accident. We saw a plane crash, like all, all kind of, we flew in a really scary, dangerous helicopter ride with lightning all around. So oh, this sounds like a Bruce Willis movie from like 1990. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Uh, it is, it was legitimately a very interesting ride. Wait, but what kind of trip way, was this? It was a group trip. It was, it was a small group. A very good friend of mine um, from Tampa, Florida is Nepalese. He moved to Tampa to go to college and then stayed in America after that. Um, he used to be a Sherpa and a porter uh, in Nepal on the trek. So he knew a lot of people. So it was a very locals driven trip, which was amazing. So we got to really immerse more in the culture than we would have if we were on kind of a an REI or a G Adventures type trip. Um, it was very, very local for us. And do you um, do a lot of these kind of trips? I try to, I, uh, you know, a lot of times I don't have the personal connection. So I do a lot of international trips and a lot of service work internationally, but, yeah. and, and, and domestically, but so you I do a lot of like organized trips, organized trips. Yeah. So I Amazing. did a, a, like 10 years of travel by myself. And so I would just okay. sign up with a group and make new friends. So, I love that. That's so yeah. cool. And you make like super close friends and then you're never in touch ever again. Oh, right. Except for the WhatsApp. WhatsApp has actually changed that. Like we're still in touch with our group from Morocco. And like we jazz each other about uh, right. you know, soccer and, and politics and all kinds of things on the WhatsApp group text. Cool. So we may not see yeah, them again, yeah. but there's sort of an energy still still living with us. Oh, I love that. Well, yeah. so there's so much here. So where do you want to start? Like, so you're telling the story of the travel, but how does trauma figure into that? Yeah. So along the track, each stop, each village along the track, um, harkens back to some sort of life story of mine. So some Beautiful. of them were very traumatic and it was a way to sort of heal from trauma. Some of them were other travel experiences and what they, what life lessons they taught me. And they all have a tie-in to each village along the trek. That sounds like an amazing structure for a book, but did it actually organically, every stage of the travel tied in with just organically with life experiences? Yeah, they do. And interestingly enough, my mom, when she read the book, she asked me, she's like, you didn't include this story. You didn't include this story. And I was like, well, I couldn't include everything because it didn't have a tie-in. So I, you know, I feel very blessed to say I've been, you know, sort of traveling and doing service work for um, 20 years, at least maybe, maybe more like 30 and uh, since I was a teenager. And so I had all these amazing stories to choose from. And I chose the ones that seem to naturally fall you know, in line with something from the actual village or from that piece of the trek. Beautiful. So most of us, like when we think about traveling, we we think of like Emily in Paris, like we're going to just go travel somewhere, get some souvenirs, eat some cool food, take lots of selfies. I'm not trying to demean it. I mean, I'm honestly, that's like pretty much what I do. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to be very environmentally responsible, but service travel or, or what did you call it? Um, is that what you call it? Service travel. Mm -hmm. So how does one engage with that or find out about it? So I always tell people, start with what you organically love. If you organically love animals, find an animal rescue that does work in, you know, sometimes just domestically, or if you love children, or if you love, you know, adventure travel, then there's a place where you could go. Or if you like to build structures, right? So I um, have a passion for, for hands-on work. So I have gone to Nicaragua and built houses with habitat. I went to Peru and did farming. I took students when I worked at a university, I took students up to the Baltimore DC area and we did urban farming. So I really enjoy like the hands-on. So that's, I don't have a particular, you know, like children versus adults versus elderly as much as what can I do that's hands-on. So I just got back from Sierra Leone where I was working with an organization that helps um, women in Sierra Leone 
uh, who have been victims of domestic violence. And often they leave their, their abuser and they end up on the streets because there's not a lot of jobs for women. And so we actually went out onto the streets. We went into brothels and we were talking to them about how we can get them into trade schools and get them- By, by ending by up on the streets, do you mean prostitution or prostitution. Yeah. Or, okay. Both actually. A lot of, I mean, they, they start as homeless and then they end up sex work as a, as a job. And then they kind of gather together in these brothels. So yeah, talk about trauma. So it's not just your, not, I don't mean just, but not just your personal trauma, but it's engaging in, in a responsible, helpful way and in, in other people's and other uh, locales trauma. Right, right. Actually, the very beginning of the book sort of walks through this. I found out um, around age 40 that I was not gonna be able to have kids. I had to have emergency surgery. And so children were not going to be a part of my journey. And it made me really stop and think, about what do I want my legacy to look like? Because women often say their legacy is their children. If you ask them their greatest accomplishment, their children always usually come first, always usually, but usually. Uh, yeah. come first. And if you don't have that, if you're not a part of that community, um, the way that you expected to be as all kind of little girls growing up, um, or I should say most, because there's plenty of people who make a, a intentional choice earlier. I sort of made an unintentional choice right. uh, and then medical realities. And so I really thought intentionally about what do I want to do with my life? What do I want my legacy to be? Where do I, where do I want to see, you know, people remember me by later. And so it became, I became really passionate about this service, about what can I do with both my sort of my brain talents, my heart talents and my hands talents um, for people in um, both in America and, and, and abroad. So what about, I mean, it seems like you're kind of, you know, fearless, although that word is sort of loaded, but like for people who don't know how to farm or people who don't know how to build a structure or for, for people who don't know what, the, how the heck to help in a genuinely helpful way, not just like a, you know, what do they call it? Like, a, you know, some sort of like condescending helpful yes, way. Like the white thing yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, how do you engage in like, you know, these women on the streets, street, you know, street. going through domestic abuse and then prostitution, homelessness. I mean, these are intense things. How do you, how do you recommend people genuinely move forward? Because I think a lot of people want to help, but they don't know how to genuinely help without just creating more chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Um, partnerships are definitely key, right? Um, finding the right organization. And like, I, that's why I go back to like- Doing it with an organization that can- With an organization, you. right. That can show you. That if you make genuine connections and you want to go back on your own. I, so for example, um, the Nepal the Nepal trip that this book is based on happened in 2019. But I kept up with a lot of people in country as well as my friend who lives in here in America. And I've now been asked to go back and sort of by myself, I'm going to trek four or five hours into the mountains and teach financial literacy to women at um, some villages that don't. Um, and so that's just based on connections and it doesn't require the whole group to be a part of it. But I maintain those those connections because I'm really passionate about it. And I taught financial literacy in, in other ways. They, my friends from Nepal got wind that I was doing that and said, we need that here. And so uh, that's, so I think it, you know, start small. If it's just in your backyard, that's okay. You don't, it doesn't have to be extravagant. Find something you're really passionate about and then find an organization who's doing something. And even if it's, you know, one Saturday a month or one afternoon, if it's like tutoring kids or whatever, there's something magical and self fulfilling. That's all about being selfless in that way. Yeah. We have a comment from Omri saying, this is awesome. I think you also said, uh, you were in Nepal for three years. So Awesome. How the heck do you, again, like that fearless word, which, you know, from a Buddhist point of view, fearless means you feel the fear and you intelligently move forward. It doesn't mean you like suppress the fear and pretend to be macho, but like, how do you, how do you feel, feel safe, safe alone, alone in Nepal? How, how do you uh, know how to teach financial literacy in a foreign language to women who have a totally different life experience? How do you feel like, how do you figure that That's stuff out? out? I know you have this return, return trip, trip, but. Yeah, you know, I think it, it really starts with um, releasing your expectations and releasing your ego. So I'm not afraid to be a student. I'm not afraid to show up in a country and I'll do all my homework and I'll read Love things that. and I'll, I'll gather all the information and I'll ask people all the questions. Tell me about your culture. Tell me about, you know, tell me about the food. Tell me why you eat Dalbot 
24 hours a day, right? 20, that's a saying with all the Sherpas is Dalbot power 24 hour, which um, became like super charged up for us. And, you know, like I ask all the questions of why and where does it come from? And I'll read the books or the articles or the local newspaper if I can find an English version. version. And and those are, you know, just being a, uh, being a student again, being open to experience and being open to messing up and saying, I'm not going to be perfect at this, right? I'm going to do all the research and I'm going to teach, I'm going to try to understand where people are, like the financial literacy, for example, try to understand their their relationship to banks, their relationship to money as best you can from afar, and then go and just have a genuine conversation about women empowerment. Because sometimes it's not necessarily just about the curriculum, it's about the connection and how do you just foster that connection in an organic way and just say, I'm here to help. You tell me how I can help you and I will do it. And that's power, right? It's power in in human connection and it leaves people with a lasting impression that may not be everything you know, my checklist of curriculum, they may remember one thing, but the connection they'll remember for, for a long time. I bet. And, um, and how do you feel safe? That like basic question, which I know has a lot of privilege built into it, but like, you want to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think that has been something that has just grown organically over the years. So, you know, I, I took small risks around, I tra- I started traveling domestically by myself. I would just go for a weekend somewhere by myself. I, I, I have a bucket list to see a baseball game at every major league stadium. So I would just fly there to see. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. I've done 21 so far. What are your favorite stadiums and why are they Wrigley and Fenway? <laughs> they are not Wrigley and Fenway, although I'm a Cubs fan. Wrong. So- Wrigley is awesome. However, Camden Yards is just this magical space that feels like you're walking into a castle. Is that San Francisco? No, um, the Orioles, Baltimore Orioles. Oh, Orioles. But that's an old one, right? It's a, it, well, no. Or did they rebuild it? They rebuilt it, yeah. Uh, okay. But it's just well done. It's just all brick and big tall walls and you feel yeah. a little bit like a fairy tale. Yeah. Oh, that should be your next book. Like, traveling to <laughs> all- the first. <laughs> What's that? I have to finish the circuit and then I can write about it all. So yeah. And tell me a little bit, is this your first book or not? This is my first book. I, I mean, I wrote a dissertation because I have a PhD, but that's pretty boring. Right. So this is the first book that anyone would want to read. <laughs> so tell me, you know, I teach a writing class, Elephant Academy, all that. Tell me about your writing process. Like how did you find time for it? inspiration? How did you structure it? How are you you know, marketing it and doing all that. Cause that's an yeah, amazing yeah. thing too. It's, you know, every, it, it's a process, right? So I was smart enough, um, intuitively, un, unintentionally, but intuitively to save every. So I've been, a, I wrote my first book at 10 years old. I, um, it, like in colored pencil, right. It was a whole story, 10 chapters, like, you know, baby chapters, but I, and I, so I was always a journal. I was always a journaler. So I kept every journal. I scanned them, I scanned them and put them away in a computer file somewhere. I kept important emails. I kept screenshots of text messages, all of these things that I, so I took myself down to Taos, New Mexico, and I um, rented a refurbished Airstream named Rosie. She was a former circus trailer. She was adorable. And I sat for a week and I just reread everything I could find for about 10 years of like the, the, the chapter of my life. I thought this was going to touch. Oh, cool. And I just kind of tried to look at it with like a journalist, like yeah. what did I learn from this? Like put myself back in that position, but from a journalistic perspective. Um, and then I could write the stories. And so that's how I kicked it off. I literally took off a week of work and went and did this for a week. Then I had to figure out the cadence of, okay, how do you keep doing this while you live the rest of your regular life? Which for me is I, I take a page out of Julia Cameron's book and I do morning pages. So I just made it a habit, three pages a day. Some of them I tossed out, some of them got progress. Sometimes I had an extra hour and I did you know 10 pages or whatever, but I just, I made it um, a habit and was unattached to the outcome of whether or not those pages were going to be good or not. It was just the habit of every day writing. Love that. Yeah. That's an important sure. one. Um, we featured Julia Cam- Cameron on here, um, you know, is people are so kind of caught up in imagining the book and the, and the perfect book title and the book reading and, you know, yeah. running around being a famous yeah. author in their tweed jackets or their pipes or whatever, but they don't, they don't slow down to write the book and and be humble enough to like write a lot of crap which is fine the crap is actually usually not that bad and 
you know, so you get caught up in all these expectations and then it's, then it's actually hard to actually do it. So good for you.